joins us every Friday and he comes and goes on a rainbow. Everybody, hi. Hi, it's, uh, listen, I'm always happy to be with the uh, co-leader of uh, Clay <laughs> McAllister and uh, obviously Alberto Magnifico. Um, uh, Mark is, of course, uh, toiling away, or he's just a chicken. He's afraid to face me because that's right. I've eaten a pork chop in my day. I have, and I know he's very upset about that, but we got to do what we got to do. What? Uh, if I seem a little off, Kim, uh, I've been arguing with my car's chat GPT all morning. It's Is been, that why? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's been a problem. Uh, plus, you know, uh, 20 minutes today uh, getting fertility tips from Al Pacino. I just, you know, I'm doing what I can, you know? Hey, okay, if you're day, looking sir. to be an older dad, he's the one to talk to, right? Apparently, uh, you want to get to some movie reviews, don't you? Let's do it, because the first one I think is Elemental, and this is one that I'll be watching with my kids. Well, uh, let's kick it off, uh, and I'll be straight up with you. I'm a big fan of Pixar's movies. Uh, Elemental is the umpteenth Pixar animated feature, and it's here. Uh, and it's a disappointment in comparison to the oh. studio's premier films, such as The Incredibles, Toy Story, Inside Out, and the recent Oscar winner, Soul. Uh, one of the issues is that Elemental is about too many things, uh, even though a, a problematic romance is set up as central to the story. So the hook here is that our heroine and hero live in a world comprised of people who are either made of water, fire, earth, or air. Ember is a girl of the fire people and wade is a boy of the water people okay. uh, ember's family has moved to element city or whatever they called the place uh from their island home which i assume is fire island not to be confused with the one <laughs> in uh, in new york um but now they appear to be living in an urban fire people ghetto so Wade is a well-off water inspector who meets Ember when checking out the flow of steam at her father's grocery store slash cafe. The setup is clunky, uh, but the movie requires what we call in the business a meet cute. So complications ensue, of course, since the path to true love, blah, 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 you know. Anyway, Elemental is well-meaning, heart in the right place stuff that must have seemed exciting in conception, but for all its ambition and humanity, and remember that its human stand-ins are sectors of a society compri uh, comprised of the four element groups, the world building here is haphazard. Um, there's a comedian, a late comedian, George Miller, friend of David Letterman, who used to say, if you buy the premise, you buy the bit. And it's so hard to buy the premise here because of uh, the lack of a clear-cut setup in my book. And we don't really know enough about the earth and cloud people, let alone the water and fire folk. And one must assume that each elemental ethnicity is meant to represent something. So yeah. who colonized the city? Are the fire people the only ostracized part of the society? Uh, as earnest as elemental is in its commentary on immigration uh, and such, it's, it's kind of heavy handed. And even with some sly, typically clever Pixar gags, mostly of the visual variety, this doesn't seem to know what its central theme is. Is it about immigrant striving, racial and ethnic prejudice, bureaucratic entanglement, which becomes an issue, or is it star-crossed romance? And like, for instance, Ember's father keeps changing his perspective on his devoted daughter who is tapped to take over the family business. And, you know, clearly there's a kind of a Montague Capulet thing going on here. You know, a fire person and a water person falling in forbidden or, I don't know, chemically problematic love. Uh, it's so in your face that the grace of Pixar's best work makes Elemental seem kind of like a hyperkinetic throwaway. Uh, if, it's, if it's meant as primarily a romantic comedy about opposites attracting, it isn't rom or calm enough to sell the whole enterprise. But that said, the voice actors, they're solid as Ember and Wade, relative unknowns Leah Lewis and um, Mamadou Athi uh, provide charm to a script that sometimes ladles on the syrup. And there's no finding fault with the bigger names in the voice cast. Uh, Wendy McClendon Covey is a, a, a bureaucratic um, air person named Gail. Wow, what a stretch there. And Catherine <laughs> O'Hara is Wade's mother, Brooke. Oh my God, she's a water person. Uh, <laughs> 
On the eye candy front, the animation is, as usual, top shelf, and the environments are dazzling and almost too dazzling, but the character designs are kind of uneven, as are the characterizations of each uh, sector of elemental society. But, but it isn't bad. I think you and the family are going to enjoy watching it, uh, yeah. and it, it's certainly dwarfed by the greatness of 2020's Soul, uh, which was just a couple of Pixar's ago. I mean, it's sad that Soul was only on Disney streaming and Elemental is getting the big screen treatment because going by quality, it should have been the other way around. Uh, as it played out, I just didn't care about the fate of Ember and Wade. They might have well has made... They, how about a movie about the romance between Reddy Kilowatt and Elsie the Borden Cow? I mean... <laughs> Uh, by the way, there's a recurring torrent of tears thing from the uh, over-emotional water people. Um, it's supposed to be a riot. I was kind of hoping that the riot police of Element City would put a stop to it. Uh, 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 <laughs> Elemental in theaters may be better when it eventually reaches Disney+. Plus. Oh, well, yeah. I'm kind of disappointed because, you know, I have to watch it anyway. So there it is. Oh, it, it's yeah. not bad, Kim. Yeah. It's just not up to what they've done in the past. Yeah. Yeah, And, uh, you know, the past is always going to be in your face when it comes to stuff like comic book movies. Um, and that's the case uh, with The Flash. And in the case of The Flash, we're talking about years and years of comic books featuring the character. He is one of the most venerable superheroes in the history of comic books. Uh, you know, back in the early 40s, Superman came to the fore and there were all these mystery men created by comic book companies because America needed kind of uh, I guess, uh, a sense of power and strength in the face of World War II. And, uh, you know, it was kind of wish fulfillment that superheroes could probably fight for good against the forces of evil. Um, the Flash was one of those superheroes they created. Everybody had to have their own power, I guess. And the Flash's power was he can run really fast. And <laughs> There have been other speedsters in the comics, uh, Johnny Quick, Quicksilver, one called the Wizard. <laughs> I, I don't even want oh, to touch that name. No. <laughs> but, but DC's The Flash was the first, introduced back in the 40s as a collegiate type named Jay Garrick, who got his uh, speed by inhaling hard water fumes. Um, I don't, I don't, is there science involved there? Really? I don't know. Okay. Anyway, um, he was retooled in the late 50s as police forensic scientist Barry Allen, who was struck by lightning and a random bottle uh, of chemicals. And thus, given super speed, he was joined by a protege named Wally West, a.k.a. Kid Flash, who now shares the mantle of the Flash in DC Comics with Barry. I mean, there have been so many members of the Flash family over time, you can kind of confuse them. But the character of Barry Allen has also spawned TV shows and lately been brought to life on the big screen as a member of DC's Justice League, uh, where he happens to be mentored by Ben Affleck's Batman and is basically a radically different guy from the comic book Barry Allen or even the recent version on the CW show The Flash. For one thing, the movie Flash is played by the overgrown problem child Ezra Miller. And instead of Barry being a mature, straight-shooting, regular guy type, as he is in the comics, Miller's Barry is a young, scattered, socially awkward goofball, more like a mix of Peter, Spider-Man, Parker, and Kid Flash. And based on uh, the Flashpoint storyline from the comics, this movie essentially is built around a plot point that is also a longtime element of comic book Barry's character. When Barry was a boy, his father was wrongly accused of killing his mother and subsequently imprisoned. So since Barry can run so fast that he can actually break the time barrier, that's fast, uh, he decides to go back to right before his mom's death and stop it from happening, saving her and saving his father from a jail sentence. But in Back to the Future butterfly effect fashion, this changes the timeline and leads to a world that's vulnerable to an invasion by the rogue Kryptonian Zod and yeah. to a Gotham City with a retired Batman who is not played by Affleck, but is instead Michael Keaton in the role of Bruce Wayne as in the Tim Burton Batman movies. And that's kind of a treat. Keaton's uh, revisited Bruce Wayne is retired and haggard, but Barry and the even more immature Barry Allen of this broken timeline, which is Miller playing opposite himself. So, so Kim, if you don't like Ezra Miller, this is a double dose. 
Anyway, they have to convince this Bruce Wayne to oppose Zod and save Earth. But they can only do this with the help of another Kryptonian, a girl who has come to our planet and was captured by the Russians. So the third act of this thing is a it's computer generated madness. It's a free for all that devolves even further into a fan service carnival of cameos and Easter eggs. Uh, the script and Miller provide some funny moments uh, orchestrated by director Andy Muschietti, who's probably best known for the recent remake of Stephen King's It. But screenwriter Christina Hodson's everything but the cosmic treadmill approach becomes problematic, um, prohibitively cluttered and convoluted. And there are more than a few gaping plot holes, especially one regarding the death of Barry's mom. Still, Keaton ends up being this blast of snarky energy. Sasha Kahl, as the girl from Krypton, is a kind of a fresh presence. And there is an opening sequence with the Flash saving Get Ready, a hailstorm of falling babies after a hospital uh, nursery is destroyed by an explosion. Uh, and this was a sheer delight. So Warners and DC are moving away from the current movie uh, iteration of their superheroes. And in general, I think it's a good thing. Uh, at two hours and 24 minutes, the flash speeds by. But in the end, I kind of was as exhausted as this take on the Justice League has become. Uh, bring on the next DC Universe movie release. Uh, and bring it ASAP. Uh, this is in theaters. Uh, again, you're talking to a fan of the of the medium, yeah. and I had, I had problems here because you really love these kinds of movies, these Marvel movies, comic book movies. So I do. I generally yeah. do. You know, um, a movie that you wouldn't expect uh, to be uh, my favorite of the week uh, is uh, a movie called The Blackening. Now. I don't know. I don't know. Contrary to what you might think, The Blackening is not a documentary about New Orleans chef Paul Prudhomme's recipe for uh, preparing redfish. It is, in fact, a decent satire of horror movies uh, with a nod to the general dispensation of the lone black character when a slasher targets a group of friends in peril in one of these films. You know, he, he's always the first to go, isn't he yep. or she? That's right. So if Scary Movie and Get Out had a cheerfully goofy baby, uh, it would be The Blackening. Uh, although not uh, wildly hilarious or truly scary, the movie is clever in the way uh, uh, that it does what it does, and it's definitely a fun time, and it's going to be a real treat for home viewing. I guess it would be a fun night out this weekend, but it'll play well at home as well. Um, that The movie is being released this weekend uh, is part of its charm, actually, since the story concerns a group of friends, all black, who are uh, reuniting during a Juneteenth weekend getaway to a cabin in the woods. That's right. Man, red flags are going up everywhere. A cabin in the woods. Uh, wouldn't you know that they're all being stalked by a murderous fiend who wants to toy with them, even as he knocks them off? Um, the cast, of uh, many of whom... Uh, are pretty uh, unknown, I would think. They're having a ball here, and you feel it. Director Tim Story, who did Barbershop, and also uh, one or two self-contained, uh, mediocre, Fantastic Four movies for Marvel back in the day. Uh, he's in his glory with this type of comedy. And the script by Dwayne Perkins, uh, who plays Dwayne in the movie, and Tracy Oliver, who I think has worked with Amber Ruffin, um, who's a veteran of the Seth Meyers show, uh, Late Night. Uh, it's, it's this is a smart, uh, clever, pointed script. I love the takedowns of the stereotypes of all the movies coming out this weekend. And two of them are obviously major, major releases. The yeah. Blackening is the one that hit the spot for me. It's in theaters. Is it gory? It's funny. I mean, I don't, again, I don't know that horror movies are your metier. I, I wouldn't yeah. suggest you watch it. But, you know, if you do like horror movies, this has got uh, a lot of juice to it. Um, I want to quickly mention that there's a documentary now available on Disney Plus called Stan Lee. And it's about the comic book creator who basically was the driving wheel behind all the Marvel superheroes that have become a multi, multi-billion dollar business in film and television uh, in this century. And Stan uh, came from modest beginnings in the early part of the 20th century, the son of Eastern European immigrants. Yeah. And he started out in the comic business when a teenager. And uh, eventually he became the uh, 
publisher, well, editor in chief, uh, chief creator at Marvel Comics. If Stan was still with us, I might call this a vanity project. But for all of its puffery, it's an interesting American success story about a remarkable creative force who has had a massive impact on global popular culture. Uh, it's it's worth a look, particularly if you don't know much about Stan and his history. Uh, you know, he was also a valiant fighter for uh, human rights, uh, equality. He was um, anti-prejudice, uh, anti-bigotry, all his uh, career as a writer, uh, a good man. And wow, a significant is too light a word to describe Stan Lee. Can we quickly squeeze in the worst ones? Uh, the worst what? The worst ones, the movie. Now, you know what? I would actually like to briefly mention a show I've been watching on television, um, well, on Netflix for the past yeah. couple of weeks, and I am intoxicated by. Can we do that? Yeah. All right. I really want to mention it because it's so good. Uh, it's called The Diplomat, and The Diplomat uh, stars Curry Russell and Rufus Sewell, the British actor, uh, in a political drama. And uh, they're a married pair of U.S. ambassadors. Uh, Sewell plays uh, American in this one. Kerry Russell, by the way, was one of the uh, co-stars with Matthew Reese, now her husband in The Americans. And she is absolutely great here. Uh, she is assigned to become the ambassador to England during a crisis in the Gulf. And... Uh, everything kind of goes haywire. He's, he's also the Rufus Sewell character. Her husband is an old hand, well-loved uh, at the top of the administration. Uh, there's all this tension. Um, they have a seriously earthy relationship and it's as bracing as the show's realistic, no holds barred dialogue. I mean, this is like things you'd never hear on the West wing as a jeopardy category. Yeah. I mean, it, it really is spicy and smart. And uh, the inner workings of global uh, politics have never been more entertaining than on The Diplomat, uh, available via Netflix. And it's kind of funny because Russell has this wonderful show, and her husband had one of my favorite shows of the past decade, Perry Mason, on HBO, until it was untimely, uh, in untimely fashion canceled recently. But uh, I guess the family's doing good. I watched this show when it first came out, and I had my husband watch it, too. We ate it up. We loved it. It was really good. I'm glad you're enjoying it. I just watched yeah. episode one of series two of Star Trek Strange New Worlds with Anson oh. Mount, Re Rebecca Romaine, and Ethan Peck as uh, uh, Christopher Pike, um, yeah. uh, number one, and the young Spock. And, yeah, the quality has maintained. It's, it's a hell of a great show. I think Trek fans are going to be delighted to have it back. It's available on Paramount+. Plus. So a quick recap. You saw Elemental. You said it just really wasn't up to Pixar standards. Uh, regarding The Flash, you said it's got some funny moments, but the script is cluttered and convoluted with some plot holes, and you weren't super impressed. You love the blackening. You thought it was clever and fun. You also really enjoyed the Stan Lee documentary. Uh, you thought it was very worthwhile. So for those for those who don't know about Stan, yeah, for those of us who are familiar with him, it's yeah. uh, familiar territory. But uh, it's it's a little primer or primer, what, however you pronounce yeah. that. Is that a ding word, by the way? Primer. I think primer? it is. It is. We'll ding you for that. Yeah, primer. Okay, great. Yes. So um, Giants, <laughs> uh, Giants are down in what I like to call Chavez Latrine this weekend, taking on the Dodger Dogs. And not to be confused with the hot dogs sold at Dodger Stadium. I am saying from my heart, go Giants. Awesome. Michael Snyder, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for watching all those movies and letting us know before we watch them. We thank you so much. Michael Snyder, welcome. he comes and goes on a rainbow. Have a great weekend, everybody. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.